Welcome everybody, I'm Sunil Amrith, Interim Director of the Mahinder Humanities Centre at Harvard, and this is the first in a new series of conversations that we're hosting called What Next? Possible Futures, in which we'll be talking to a range of thinkers across philosophy, politics and the arts to reflect on some of the longer term implications of the multiple crises that we are living through. Um, I'm really delighted to have uh, with me today uh, Ned Hall, who's the Norman E. Viermier Professor of uh, Philosophy at Harvard, uh, Ned, welcome and thank you for doing this. Thank you for having me. Um, reflecting on the past three months, Ned, I think what has surprised me most is not the pandemic. After all, I think we've been warned for 20 or more years that something like this was very likely, if not inevitable. Uh, what surprised me most is, is the scale of the response. I mean, if you'd asked me last year, I would genuinely not have believed that so many governments around the world would willingly shut down fast areas of economic activity and, and restrict travel. And the historian Adam Tooze actually wrote a piece last month saying just that, that in one of the central articles of common sense that the interests of economic growth would always prevail has been upended. Um, what has your own reaction been to the pandemic and response, and what has surprised you most about it? Oh, that's a good question. I think what has been a welcome surprise is a sense in American society that despite the kind of cult of rugged individualism that is, has such a strong kind of ideological grip, especially in the public sphere, we've seen really concerted efforts for people to sort of live a different, you know, manifest a very different understanding of their relationship to the body politic, if you like. Um, there's been a more kind of, a, a, a kind of upsurge, I think, of a sense that we are in this together and we have to look out for each other. Um, and I find myself, you know, hopeful that, that, that that's a kind of expression of something that was submerged but powerful all along and is now going to have a chance to really sort of blossom forth. Um, and to some extent, the recent protests around George Floyd's murder are kind of reinforced that hope. And at the same time, I, I find myself like on tenterhooks wondering like, well, is this just going to get repressed? No. Because, um, of course, we've also seen, and this was not a surprise at all, we've also seen a response in the other direction from the Trump administration, which has just been astonishingly sort of feckless and corrupt in the way it's approached the pandemic. I mean, there's not a trace of a hint of a sense that, of a whisper, that the people in that administration are motivated, or at least high up in that administration, are motivated by this kind of sense that in uh, if we're going to live together, then sometimes we have to um, let our own individual interests, our own sort of sense of our um, personal gain and, and the importance that has to us give way to a sense of what our society as a whole needs. I mean, in relation to that, I suppose there's another dimension to this, which is that you know, a large number of studies already have pointed out the direct connection between the pandemic and accumulative environmental harm including but not limited to climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think faced with the enormous human suffering of the pandemic, um, these deeper roots of the crisis, I think, often fade from view and perhaps understandably so. Uh, do you think we need a new way to talk about the relationship between environmental harm and, and human suffering in relation to the pandemic? Yes, absolutely. And I wish I could tell you something kind of intelligent or deep or subtle about what that new way is but I feel like my, I myself am kind of fumbling to figure that out. Um, um, and partly that's because as a philosopher, I, I lack some of the, the tools needed to think through this. Like the, if we're gonna craft a new way of thinking about our relationship to the environment and, and the way that relationship intersects with basic issues of social justice, then um, we're gonna, that's gonna involve, you know, in the academy, combined efforts of historians, sociologists, psychologists, philosophers, economists, too. Um, and as a philosopher, I, some things leap out to me. Um, philosophers tend to be good at spotting ways in which language and concepts direct our thought and, and, and sometimes warp our thought. So, so it's easy to notice that certain kinds of neoliberal ways of thinking um, structure debate around climate change. Um, and not for the better. 
No, it's easy for us to spot that. It's less easy to know how to craft an alternative, let alone how to get an alternative to take within the public sphere. Um, so, you know, we've seen this close to home. I think um, the response, I'm just gonna be blunt about this, the response from, the, from Larry Bacco and the corporation about divestment has to my mind and the mind of many of my colleagues betrayed a kind of limited intellectual imagination. No, um, we hear things like, well, we need to work with the fossil fuel industry. We need to engage with them. Um, and, and where, it, in, in fact, for someone who's coming to this from outside, it isn't so wedded to kind of neoliberal market-based um, approaches. You think, no, like what we need as a society is to rethink the role of that industry and really large industries in uh, politics um, and, and culture. And that may require a much more oppositional stance. Yeah. You know, I, I share that sense of grappling towards a new vocabulary or a new way of imagining, you know, particularly connecting the two things, you know, what you pointed out, which is a sort of a greater sense of collective solidarity that we have seen and, and how that can come together with a different way of seeing ourselves in relation to the environment and to the rest of nature as well. And I think that that is the sort of challenge. It, Building on what you've just said, though, it is hard to avoid the striking contrast between the scale of the emergency response to the pandemic and decades of inaction over the ultimately far greater threat of, of climate change. How do you explain that? I mean, I think we all have been working through this in our minds, but what, what in your mind is, is the underlies that disjuncture? So, so I'm not sure. I'll offer a speculation. Um, I think that as, as moral beings, as, as people who sometimes at least think through moral problems and how to respond to those problems, the way we think is guided by a certain kind of like training that we get. Um, it's not formal training, um, but we get a lot of training in how to think about moral situations just as we grow up and live with other people. And I think that kind of training equips us very well to deal with um, moral situations that have a kind of immediacy um, to them and are personal in some way. So with something like a pandemic, you can read stories, even if you yourself are not affected and none of you, the people you know and love are affected, you can read specific stories about people who are affected. You, know, you can see concretely the damage that the virus is doing to people, um, uh, even people who survive it. Uh, we could make the same point about the responses to George Floyd's murder. You know, I think someone who's really a, like deeply aware and educated about um, systemic racism in American society might be forgiven for being a little bit bemused at, at, at how strong the reaction is. Not because it's inappropriate that the reaction be as strong as it is, but it's like, why now? You know, all, the, all you people who can't, like genuinely, sincerely, why didn't you care before? And I think partly that was helped because by the fact that you could watch this horrific video. Um, and, and there was a sort of, it, it um, kicks into gear a kind of, what I think of as moral heuristics that work very well in some domains and work terribly in other domains. No, like we're not good. Our moral heuristics, for example, are not good at all in getting us to respond with the right kind of moral empathy to future generations. Those people don't even exist yet, no. Um, and, and so for, you know, a lot of people, I think, even when it comes to climate change, the kind of emotional route to engagement with that is, comes less from reading, say, something like Bill McKibben's End of Nature, you know, and more from having children who uh, tell you, as my older son told my wife and me, well, you know, my partner and I are, are thinking we might have kids, but we're gonna wait another 10 years because we're not sure that it would be fair to bring a child into the world and, and that's not gonna become clear for another decade. And then when it becomes that personal, all of a sudden you think, oh, oh holy, oh, no, pardon the like, vulgarity, but holy shit, like this is a real issue. Um, and of course that always comes with some embarrassment too. So, you know, when, um, the, uh, uh, there's a kind of complicated layering of responses, right? Like until you have some kind of direct emotional route into the issue, it can be difficult to engage. And also you have to confront a kind of headwinds, emotional headwinds, when you start engaging seriously with something like climate change, because there's always the voice in the back of your head, it's in my head, like, why weren't you doing this 10 years ago? 
No, I, I think that's right. But I mean, in, in a much more concrete sense, I suppose, one of the standard responses by businesses, by governments to calls for action on climate change is that it is too expensive and too economically disruptive. Mm -hmm. Do you think our recent experience opens a window to rethinking that answer, yeah. that standard yeah. answer? I, I think it definitely opens a window. Um, I have no idea how that opportunity will be capitalized on, but I hope that we can find a way to. Um, um, I think um, to some extent, how that plays out may hinge on how the recovery, the economic part of the recovery from the pandemic looks. Like it, um, and, and we both know that that itself is gonna hinge on you know, what happens in November in, in the election. Um, but again, this is the hopeful part of me thinks that we may be able to come out of this um, uh, rethinking how we sort of fashion the economy, how we think about work, how we think about, um, you know, basically the social contract between um, employers and their employees um, in a way that we can then capitalize on in thinking about climate change too. I, I, I hope so too, and, and clearly sort of so, so much of this is very sort of delicately poised between optimism and, and, and utter despair, it's certainly my own, own, own view. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so no, just, oh, just to add one thing to that, I think, you know, so, so as a, like thinking, coming to this as a philosopher, of course, as I said before, I feel like there's a whole bunch of stuff I need to understand better, um, because it's not, you know, the, the problems we're tackling are not just in the realm of concepts, right? But, but there is a, a kind of interesting conceptual component to it. You know, when, when I talked about like the moral heuristics we use, um, part of the problem is that we, our, our moral training equips us with certain ways of thinking about even basic notions like responsibility. Um, and we tend to think in ways about responsibility in ways that work perfectly well if we're talking about ordinary interpersonal reactions. So like a standard equation we'll use is, well, look, if something bad has happened to you, Sunil, then my responsibility to help you um, depends directly on what sort of causal influence I had. Was I causally responsible for that harm in a direct way? Um, if not, um, I don't have a responsibility to help you, or at least I don't have an obligation to. It might be supererogatory for me to. Um, and then when you think about that kind of attitude when it confronts a problem at the scale of climate change, that kind of attitude can be deadly because I could easily think like, well, look, it's not gonna make a difference if I ride my bike to work. Um, or I could just think whatever political efforts I take on, they, those probably won't make a difference. Or I could think like, I, working retrospectively, I'm not responsible for the problem we're in. So like I didn't cause it, so I don't have some special obligation you know, to take uh, part in fighting it. Um, and it's, it's the same kind of dynamic you see playing out right now in discussions of, of anti-racism, where people who are, who are heavily involved in anti-racist efforts are trying to get a conversation going, which I think is long overdue, saying to people like, especially white people in this country, look, even if you are not directly responsible for systems of oppression, it's not enough for you to just say, well, I'm, I'm going to make sure I don't cause harm. Like, like it's not merely supererogatory for you to take the extra step of investing serious efforts of your own to combat racism. It's an obligation you have. Um, and I think that's hard for people to wrap their heads around, just given the way we're morally trained. Um, and at bottom, I think it's because we have the wrong notion of responsibility that we bring to thinking about these issues. So that's just the one thing I wanted to add. No, and I, and I think that goes a long way to, I think, to sort of, tease out some of the distinctions between the ways in which we've responded to this particular emergency and the pandemic and, and the ways in which we collectively responded to, to, to climate change. Because I think it's been much easier in the case of the pandemic to trace direct kind of causal connections between right. my actions right. and the possibility of the spread of this pandemic in my community uh, versus these, these much more abstract and Absolutely much larger scale um, that these issues I can wear done. a mask and thereby reduce the probability should I happen to be infected of hurting someone else. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so you and I, Ned, have been involved in a number of conversations over the past couple of years, more specifically on what universities can and should do in relation to the climate crisis. And I'd like to begin on the intellectual side of things. 
thinking ahead over the next few years and in light of what we've all just experienced, do you believe we need to change the way we teach the humanities in particular to take the climate crisis into account? Yes, yes. So Harvard, for example, um, has already on the books a wonderful and, and very popular course called, that you know all about, called Humanities 10, um, which is a, a kind of very intensive year-long look at some sort of, sort of great works of literature from, from different traditions. You could easily imagine a humanities course center of the same structure that involves like, like five or 10 professors year long, mm -hmm. all centered around humanities relationship to the environment. Um, and I think that like something like, I think of that because it would be a high profile thing that Harvard could do. So it's a single course, obviously. So you think like how, how much of an impact could that have? But given the precedent established by Humanities 10, mm. a course like that would immediately send a signal, not just to the student body, but to the world at large, that like the humanists at Harvard are now thinking of themselves as having an obligation to use what they know to help steer the conversation in the, in the future. Um, you use I the word that, obligation. Do, do you think we do have an obligation here? Yeah, I do. And I think that's somewhat hard for academics because when you talk about obligations like this, there can there can be a felt threat to academic freedom. No. Um, and and so that's a difficult thing to to you know navigate. I'm not sure I know how to navigate it. Um, but that said, I I do think we have an obligation. Um, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I think just speaking about philosophy for the moment, because I'm not going to pretend to know what it's how you know, teaching and research and the dis discipline's conception of itself have evolved in other parts of the humanities. Mm -hmm. Within philosophy, I think we've, over the last 30 years, which is about the span that I'm most intimately familiar with, become kind of complacent. That is, there's been a kind of conception within the field that, well, we get to carve out problems to work on that we think are fun and interesting. And success in the field, which is the thing that matters to people. It's not money, obviously. <laughs> um, uh, success in the field um, hinges on your ability to say something new and insightful and clever about one of the sort of questions that have been served up by the discipline. And there hasn't been a lot of, of conscious thought within the discipline about what that menu of questions should look like. That's starting to change, I think. But I think the obligation, that's one place the obligation starts. You no, know, it's, um, uh, within a discipline, any discipline is going to define itself in part by what questions it considers most urgent or sexy, you know? Um, and oftentimes that just sort of happens organically in a way that, that people within a discipline, at least if they're like philosophy, don't really consciously try to direct. And I think we have an obligation to rethink that, you no. Know? And again, you have to be careful here. You don't want like some central authority saying, these are now the questions that philosophy shall address. I mean, it couldn't happen, right? Uh, but, you, but you don't want to think about it that way. Um, but within the discipline still, I think we need to think like in what ways can philosophy make a difference to the public at large? That's something that I was never trained to think about as a graduate student. And I think like we need to change the way we think and that has to affect how we mentor our own graduate students. And it also has to sort of, um, have echoes in the kind of teaching we do um, for our undergraduates. I would say very similar things about history. I mean, I think it is things are changing, and I think the the menu of questions is 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 starting to encompass some of the things we've been talking about. Yeah. But but that hasn't really been the case over the last twenty years. I mean, I think part of the challenge may be to sort of you know, the environmental humanities are are thriving at Harvard and elsewhere, but perhaps still seen as 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 a sort of subfield as as separate and and some yeah. of the challenge might be to bring these questions into into everything that we do. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I think that's right. And I, I think and there's an additional dimension to this, because if we think about how to teach the environmental humanities well, it has to be cross-disciplinary, just on intellectual grounds. It absolutely has to be. Um, and that's not something that we're particularly good at. Our training as graduate students does not like um, either show us how to do cross-disciplinary work um, or even sort of highlight the value of cross-disciplinary work. Um, and that's, you know, that, that's... A, like, as, as you know, there are institutional challenges there. If young people are going to get tenure, the way you get tenure now in the university is you establish yourself as a leader in some subfield within your discipline. Um, 
And that may be something that also the, that the universities need to rethink. They may need to rethink like how they award um, how, or how they sort of credential people academically and find ways to reward people who even early on in their careers do really sort of risky, interesting you know, work that involves direct collaboration with people from very different disciplines. So much more so when, when as, as we see all around us, the sort of precarity of academic labor seems to be sort of escalating in, 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 in very disturbing ways. Um, yes. and often, precarity often experienced by precisely those who are trying to break these boundaries and, and, and do this sort of work. Yeah. Um, so if we may continue uh, to sort of shift towards the institutional side of things, um, campuses around the world have been shut down and classes, seminars moved online. And of course, many of us and above all our students experience the loss of contact and community that comes with this. Um, and, and we look forward to their return. But, but are there also opportunities as we sort of pause to rethink how we do things? Um, to begin with, I've been struck by the sheer amount of academic travel around conferences, et cetera. And mm -hmm. Are we beginning to see this as, as wasteful? I think so, at least in the community, like in the circles that I move in, absolutely. Um, uh, I'll give you a concrete example. We're talking right now about how to run our colloquium series this year. And it's clear we're not going to be flying people in um, just because of the pandemic. And so we're thinking like, all right, how else do we do this? And one thing that we've quickly realized is this, we, we may actually get sort of better results by hosting people online. No. Um, you can do things like it's, it's, it's reasonable in a setting like that to ask people to send a paper ahead of time so that instead of having somebody come in for a kind of sort of theatrical performance where they're standing in front of you and presenting a paper that none of you have ever heard before. And so you have like 55 minutes or so to formulate some useful question. Um, you can actually have a much more deliberate process where there's like real intellectual exchange mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when it comes to things like conferences and, and colloquium talks, you know, of course, maybe there's something lost. If you could teleport the person in at no energy cost, sure. you might rather do that because there's all sorts of, of things that can happen when you're sitting down with some, uh -huh. someone. Uh -huh. There's so, sort of serendipitous intellectual interactions that are harder to replicate over Zoom. But look, we should, can recognize that cost and still think it's worth paying. No. Right. Um, so I think there's going to be a big change there. I think that that will require a change in mindset. I've talked to colleagues at other um, colleges and universities who mm. are trying to push their own colleagues to forego travel you know, and find re like remote ways to interact. Um, and there's a kind of, unfortunately, there's a kind of entitlement. It's like, what do you mean? Like, free travel or travel that paid for by my research budget, that was one of the perks, you no? Know? And, and so it's clear that there's a culture of viewing travel as the kind of like, oh, I have built-in vacation time. Um, and I think we just have to get over that, you no. Know? Um, one thing that the pandemic may do is, is get people to realize um, that shared sacrifice is, is not something to be sort of like um, um, abhorred or shunned, that we can actually live like some of us at least can live very sort of rich, meaningful, fulfilling lives, even in contexts that demand a lot of shared sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And when, when you think of the sacrifices we've made and had to make in response to the pandemic, something as small as like, oh, maybe I won't go to, you know, Berkeley to give the talk. Maybe I'll set it up remotely. That seems so trivial by comparison. There's a kind of reset, you know, kind of shift in perspective that I think we're all undergoing right now that, that we can sort of leverage. Yeah. I think that's right. The reset. I mean, you know, we've been grounded, not by choice, but, but, you know, as we are grounded for an increasing period of time, we start to understand that actually it's not so bad. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Certainly in the grand scheme of things, yeah. like, yeah. you know, I'd love to be able to go to California in the middle of winter, you know, and give a talk at Berkeley, but like, okay. <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, that's travel. Yeah. In a larger sense. Mm -hmm. How, how do you think research universities like Harvard and its peers should respond to this confluence of, of immediate crises, both around racial justice and around the pandemic uh, and the longer term climate crisis? I mean, are, are there steps you think that yeah. major research universities should be taking? Yeah. 
yeah. So, so I think so. I, I much my thoughts about the about anti-racist efforts are much more in Kuwait, but but um, uh, for reasons you you know, because I was so involved in the divestment effort at Harvard, we spent a lot of time, um, my colleagues and, and me, talking about things that universities could do, and I think universities, especially major re sorry research universities, have a, um, a very serious obligation to steer the public discussion. Um, so there are concrete things that a place like Harvard could do. Um, uh, an institution like Harvard could band together with other major research in institutions to form a consortium, for example, that put out regular updates on, on the status of the, of the global climate and the latest climate research. Um, and you know, something, something that could steer public discussion in the way that the IPCC reports do when they come out. So if you look back what happened a couple of years ago, like almost two years ago in the fall in 2018, the IPCC um, put out, it's, uh, I think that was its most recent comprehensive report and it was very grim. And that, looked, that spurred a lot of action and that actually changed the public discussion in, in sort of concrete ways. Like mm -hmm. arguably um, the Extinction Rebellion movement came out of that, um, it was certainly amplified by that. Mm -hmm. Um, but then that was it. And if you if you see what happens in public discussion, um, at, you know, outside the context of the IPCC issuing a report, you might get some report in the New York Times where the UN sort of a UN study shows some like dramatic decline in species number, and it will generate about 24 hours of discussion, and then it just everything settles back down, right? Uh, and th so there's no sustained attention to the problem. Right. Um, and of course, we know there are lots of forces in the media that are trying to like distract attention away from the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and um, colleges and universities have a role to play. Like we still, um, even now, have enough intellectual credibility that um, by forming something like a consortium yeah. and saying we are going to publish every month an update on what's happening with the climate, we could help drive the public discussion. Um, and and really, what you see there is us leveraging our kind of our sort of cultural capital um, in a way to help steer the discussion in a very mm -hmm. intentional way. That's something I absolutely think um, institutions like Harvard should do. Yeah. And there's more that they can do too, but it's just the, the steering the public discussion is one that is really, it's, it just stood out to me like a sore thumb, you know, like an obvious thing we could be doing that we're not doing. And, and something that could be pulled together really quite, quite easily based yeah. on, on what we do do already. That's right. That's right. And we have people who are much better at presenting information than the IPCC people are. Like, you try to read that report and your eyes will glaze over. Right? Mm. It's, I mean, it's got incredibly important information, but it's not presented well. So that's another thing. There's a lot. If we just look outside of science and engineering and think that this is a problem about how to communicate to the public. You know, places like Harvard um, and our peer institutions are chock full of people who thought long and hard about how to do that. And that feeds directly into what we were talking about earlier about new ways of teaching um, our own students yeah. and communicating yeah. with them. So yeah. um, on that note, thank you very, very much, Ned, for joining us.